it is my distinct pleasure to get to introduce to you Mr. John Phillips Horn. John has concentrated on criminal defense for the last 37 years, four of them with the Defender Office in San Diego, and the rest in private practice in the San Francisco area. John has spent some time as a colleague as of Charles Gary, lawyer in a number of the so-called political cases of the 1960s and 70s, including the Chicago 7 trial, who, along with Dr. Bernard Diamond, have helped pioneer approaches to the definition and assessment of what has become the diminished capacity defense in California. John started emphasizing homicide defense early in his career and defended San Francisco County's last death penalty case through trial, helping to secure a life sentence in that case. He continues to work on death penalty cases and along with Michael Burt in 2014, helped secure another life verdict in Hawaii's first death penalty case since, sorry, excuse me, since statehood. His work is such that he and Michael Burt were asked earlier this year to retry Vermont's first death penalty case. Neither Hawaii nor Vermont has a death penalty, state death penalty, and the lawyers are chosen from the ranks of death penalty defenders. These are federal cases involving extensive mental health issues. John litigated the first case in which the California Supreme Court agreed to appoint a guardian ad litem for a death row inmate found incompetent to proceed, and in more than 50 homicide cases, the other complex cases that John has defended, he has often worked with mental health and medical experts to address these issues. And I understand that he knows some of you here in this room as well. John is also one of the first, one of the lawyers on the West Memphis Three case, which has been chronicled in several movies and has garnered worldwide attention for two teenagers convicted of triple murder in Arkansas, men who were freed in 2011. For several years, John has been the author of the Forensic Mental Health Chapter and the Standard Work on California Criminal Law, Practice and Procedure, which is used by judges and lawyers around the state, and is the co-author of a similar chapter in the California Death Penalty Defense Manual. With a number of experts on mental health practice, including members of this organization, he has presented on a wide variety of matters involved in forensic mental health practice. In the last eight months alone, he has presented to groups in Texas, Louisiana, Wyoming, and the California Death Penalty Defense College, and at February's Death Penalty Seminar, the largest death penalty defense training program in the country. Anyone who's been a student of mine or someone that I have trained as a professional in my professional training knows that I love the work of John Phillips Moore. In 2004, he published an article entitled Searching for Uniformity in Adjudication of Competence to Consult and Assist in Capital Cases. It's an article that I have read myself no less than 15 times, and every time I read it, I learn just a little bit more and take away a little bit more information. I make every student that I have read this article. I think it's wonderful that somebody who studies the law and then publishes in an, a resource so accessible to us. So without further ado, I would like to in, uh, introduce Mr. John Phillips Horn. Well, good morning, and thank you so much for such a nice introduction. You can only go downhill from here. Um, I, I do want to start with a minor announcement. I, I hope that the people who were from Simon Fraser who were looking for their American flag socks last night found them. It's kind of an inside joke for some of us who were on one of the elevator rides up from the bar yesterday evening. But I'm, I'm glad to see that some intense study has been done, certainly, when the sun goes down at this conference. One of the things I do want to um, begin by, by telling you is that it's humbling to have a chance to to throw things on the floor here, but also to uh, present to your organization, in part because some of the marquee names and some of the real contributors to the development of the field of forensic uh, mental health practice are, of course, affiliated with this organization and um, ha have done tremendous work to help those of us who are in the courtroom do better at understanding 
and presenting information that is essential to useful adjudication of cases. And so I, I do want to tell you that uh, at, on the cusp of this discussion, it is a daunting task to face you and to try to discuss your field with you. And at the same time, I think one of the things, one of the places where there's a really uneasy fit between what you do and what I do, a seam, if you will, is uh, between the areas of, uh, well, uh, they are the areas of where we learn about you, we get a takeaway from the literature, from the curricula that you learn from, from the practice manuals, from the best practices series, from the many research publications. We, we learn your approaches to at least the degree that we can without the specialized training that you have. Um, we, we learn um, but uh, we learn to try to differentiate an acceptable forensic assessment from a drive-by assessment. But one of the things that hasn't really crept into your area of practice as much as I think it should, particularly currently, um, is what we also are not paying enough attention to, and that is where the case law particularly in the United States, and since I do know about the sock issue in the elevator, I know that there are people from Canada, and there may also be people who are aware and familiar with uh, forensic mental health as it is applied in English courts. I'm dealing specifically here with, with courts in the United States with standards that are applicable mainly in the United States with practice in courts in the United States. There are areas of endeavor in which the standards that you should really be paying attention to and that all of us should be informed about and the practices that are discussed and the concerns that are discussed appear in the case law. And I guess part of what I'm here to talk to you about are some of the areas in which I think in that seam, in that intersection, we need to fill in those, the gaps a little bit with attention to the case law. And what that means, from a, to borrow from a person that I admire greatly and I've had the privilege of working with and, and teaching with on a few occasions, to borrow from Richard Rogers, who, who often in his work, in his writings, talks about how to operationalize certain concepts that you draw from the research and the literature, you, you, you seek to try to put things into practice. And so, um, one of the things that I want to illustrate for you in a discussion of some cases, some recent case law and some not so recent case law, are, are areas in which the takeaway is when you are getting ready, if you're a mental health professional, to do an assessment, when you're getting ready especially to bring um, your opinion evidence into court, you really need, among the acquisitions that you, you put on the table to review, you really need to review pertinent case law. And the literature, the practice literature that concerns you, even this, these excellent works, the, the pamphlets that, that um, we've gotten from Drs. Goldstein, Heilbrunn, and Grisso, uh, the, the Best Practices series, which is a, a very, for lawyers, very informative series, and I would imagine for younger uh, professionals in your fields it is as well. One of the things that's really vastly underplayed is the importance of being familiar with the, the legal standards. And it's also in terms of actual practice, 
making sure that an essential step in your preparation, and, and really for those of you who are authors of some of the best practices books, I think you underplay the duty that you have to approach lawyers you're working with to get current jury instructions, current statutes, a current uh, body of case law to review. In, in certain instances where you're doing sanity evaluations, mental health uh, evaluation, or mental state, mental condition, mental state defense um, assessments, you need to reach out to both sides to find out what their definition of the legal parameters of the issues is. Um, even if you're retained by one particular side, I think a sound practice is for you to approach the lawyer you're working with and to indicate that a sound practice for you is to make sure that your understanding of the issues that have been bracketed by courts is sufficient to allow you to testify in a defensible way. So let's start, let, let, let me give you an illustration. And this illustration is an illustration that actually picks up on a theme that is in uh, a pamphlet written by no less than, or co-written by the president of the organization who gave me such a kind introduction, who, who has written uh, the, the pamphlet on the evaluation of competence to stand trial, and who's one of the rare, uh, uh, who's one of the rare writers in your field who actually has concentrated on an issue that's highly problematic and that's way underplayed in your field. And that is, what's a sufficient time and opportunity to do a defensible assessment? If you are working on a case involving an indigent, is there such a thing as a court giving you too few resources and too little time? Is there such a thing as your having only uh, limited access to the accused such that you really can't leave the examination room saying that you have had enough time to be able to defend your data? I can tell you having reached out, having actually done a survey of lawyers um, who do capital cases that uh, in, a, in a, and this is completely unscientific, I understand, but it's at least uh, a starting place, having surveyed 170 lawyers uh, who have had cases involving mental health practitioners, only two of them um, we're in a situation in which an examiner said, I'm not willing to go on the stand because I've had an inadequate opportunity to evaluate the accused. I don't feel I've uh, put in enough time. United States versus Merriweather, a federal capital case that uh, involved a competency question. And it's a, uh, it, it's a case that's been there that was decided by a federal district judge. Now, those of you who have some background in law or are generally aware of the functioning of the U.S. system, you would understand that this is an opinion written by a trial court. In other words, the lowest court in our legal architecture. But the importance of drilling down into these cases is as follows. It turns out that in the last approximately 10 years, the widest ranging uh, rulings on forensic mental health issues uh, have come out of trial courts, and especially federal trial courts. Because generally speaking, it is the trial courts that have the opportunity to, uh, uh, to, to assess whether or not the experts who are in a case actually are going to be permitted to testify. And so they make the evidentiary rulings, and in federal court, because federal judges have staffs that permit them to do so, they sometimes write very lengthy rulings assessing particular experts. And also, as we're gonna find out, in one of the later slides, 
If they feel that an expert has undercooked or underbaked his or her work, they put your name down in a, in a published ruling that is on the proverbial books, these days available to be easily searched through uh, electronic law libraries. And uh, it, these rulings provide ready fodder for cross-examination, which is another reason why it makes some degree of sense for you to be very familiar with the rulings that have been uh, issued by particular judges. And lest you feel that this practice of these elaborate rulings is only with federal judges these days, it actually is increasingly being, these sorts of rulings are being put out by state court judges in part because they have been influenced by this practice of uh, lengthy memoranda rulings that discuss in some detail what the experts have done. So what's the takeaway from Meriwether? Well, one of the things that was very clear about the Meriwether case, again, a competency case that kind of took on a life of its own, is that the trial court judge, when looking back over the panorama of information made available to him, was really concerned about how to, how to separate the useful evidence, the useful opinions from those that were less useful. And part of what you see in this slide, if you've been kind enough to kind of follow along, is as I, uh, the way I summarized what the judge did is that the judge w went through the sequence of events. But one of the things he pointed to was those examiners who, in his view, clearly spent too little time in contact with the accused to be able to provide reliable information. So this, uh, this uh, ruling goes on for some, some uh, space. And one of the things it covers is, is, again, something that reviewing the case law would acquaint you with. The first thing is, um, one of the things that's happening increasingly, and this tends to be a characteristic mainly of capital case work in the, in the U.S., if an individual is being housed at a state hospital or at a Bureau of Prisons facility and is being evaluated by staff at that facility, especially for something like competence or sanity, defense counsel will usually move to recuse the examiners. Why? Well, we do so mainly on the basis of a statistical showing, and, and I, I understand, since there are those of you, and it's many more than, than me, who, have, who are familiar with statistics and proper research methodology, but in a very rudimentary way, part of what you end up showing or trying to demonstrate is the degree to which staff at government-funded institutions tend to support the government's viewpoint in a given case. So in this case, one of the things you would draw were you to uh, have read it before you went into a federal court to testify about competence is the notion of some degree of independence, the need for some independence by an examiner, you would also get into another topic we're going to get into, which is the legitimacy of videotaping interviews and the reasoning for videotaping interviews that goes well beyond anything I've read in the forensic mental health literature written by forensic mental health professionals. So a number of people are called at this hearing, and um, again, the defense, uh, the, the judge is drilling down into the evidence and talks about how much time examiners have spent with the accused. Rick Dudley, Richard Dudley, psychiatrist from New York who's worked on a number of capital cases, is described as having met the accused on three separate occasions, spent 16 hours with him, and then you can kind of follow along and one of the things this judge is leading up to is that for him, 
given the issues in this case, he was concerned about people who only had occasional, occasional opportunities to see this accused. He was more interested in the circumstances presented in somebody who had essentially longitudinal data to review. And in the end, in this lengthy and completely illegible passage that I'm putting up for you, if you can read at least the, um, the bolded part, the court basically explains that in the end, and, I, and uh, I've talked to one of the lawyers who did this hearing, part of what the judge settled on and part of what the judge was pushing the parties to settle on was that if you wanted to look at the greatest um, element of reliability from a, again, not, not so much from your field's viewpoint, but from the viewpoint of the admissibility and, and evidentiary value of opinions from forensic mental health professionals, it was the amount of time that, that the examiner had to spend and spent with the accused. And so when in this pamphlet, one of the things uh, that's covered are the logistics of the evaluation and this great statement, if the timeline is too short and the evaluator does not believe that there is enough time to conduct a thorough evaluation, this should be communicated to the referral party, that's no joke. Um, that's actually not even speculation by a well thought of uh, authority in your field. That's actually something that can easily be communicated if you look at the, the audience ultimately that you're presenting to in a contested case, and that's the judiciary usually in a competence case. And so what's happened with this, this is not that old a ruling, is that now in four different competence cases that have drifted through the federal courts, part of what the parties are arguing about is whether the, uh, the assessing experts actually had what's called Merriweather time. And so you see the takeaway. One of the gateways, as you know, and, and there's a lot of writing in your field and in mine about you know, the gateways for the admissibility and the admission of, of uh, testimony from an expert has to do, among other things, whether the, the third element down, the testimony, is the product of reliable principles and methods. And in terms of our Merriweather factor, that's where the judge slotted the time factor. Exposure to the accused equals greater reliability. Now, whether that's correct or not, I mean, I, I think one view of it would be if you have schlock at the BOP facility and you have pretty poor evaluators, you're going to get just a lot of schlock done over a lot of time as distinguished with better work done by higher end better qualified, more attentive, um, more useful evaluators who only saw the accused episodically. But I think the point is made. And, you, you know, I, um, it, uh, it, was, uh, it was actually brought up when, um, when Patty was kind enough to introduce me that years ago, you know, roughly when the Spanish came to the peninsula, I was with the Defender Office here. And we used to walk up to county mental health with, and, and our clients would be brought down from the jail and we'd sit opposite a uh, psychologist who was about to do a competence evaluation, kind of looking at one another as if, okay, well, what happens now? And the practice has evolved so much but at that time, for an evaluator to spend three hours with your client was, would have been viewed as excessive. And as we know, times have changed. Protocols and methodologies have changed. That would be essentially largely unacceptable. But the point is, both from a basic practice ethics viewpoint, and now you know from a practical viewpoint, 
time spent on the job actually does matter. And whether, uh, if you, for those of you who are practicing in California, whether you're in state or federal court, uh, the, the courts will focus, as this slide informs you, uh, on whether the expert had an adequate basis for formulating um, the uh, opinion. So again, in the value of looking at case law, what else do we get from it? This case is a great case. If you don't know the case, particularly those of you who are young doctoral students or master's level students, you're interested in forensic mental health, you want to get a very humbling lesson in forensic mental health, read about Vincent Gigante. I remember the Gigante case because um, I was involved in the defense of the Bonanno cases back in the, um, the Southern District of New York, for those of you who are Godfather fans. And Vincent Gigante was not known as the Godfather, he was known as the Oddfather. And the notion was that he, he had been uh, accused in a racketeering and organized crime case, and um, the notion was that he uh, had actually um, some brain dysfunction, he, that he had significant memory problems, he was having a number of issues, and um, over a period of time, essentially, to, to wrap the thing together with you, two views of Vincent Gigante evolved. The, the government's view, which is, you know, this guy is walking around the block on the, on the arm of a nurse and kind of staggering around, is one of the great bullshit artists of all time. And uh, he has managed to essentially paint a picture of a guy who is not competent to go forward. And the, def the defense had actually lined up some, I'm a former president of the AAPL, and some of the very well-known forensic examiners on the East Coast said, oh, no, 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 you know, dementia, some uh, early imaging study or imaging studies were um, in a fairly early effort to put together a very comprehensive showing were actually introduced and uh, heavily contested both competence at trial and then later sentencing competence issues were litigated. And after both of these opinions are lengthy and very polite kind of courtly decisions by a well-known federal district judge named Jack Weinstein who said in a very nice way, you know, being very respectful of the mental health professionals, these are all fine ethical people that I always listen to, but he actually listened more to the three guards who would listen in on Gigante's phone conversations from the jail, and he sided with the government. And the bottom line was that um, we had a plethora of people who showed up with varying methodologies, varying lengths of time of observations. We had uh, multidisciplinary assessments. We had scans brought to bear, and it was crap. What I got out of it is that the forensic mental health professionals were deceived. And these were leading people. What's the takeaway? The takeaway is, and, and this is, called the, it is in our world called the Gigante Trump. And it gets to something that's in the book that Patty co-wrote and that's in the, the uh, sort of the, the, the tugboat of the forensic, the best practices series. And that's the value of accessing third party information. But if you're doing competence assessments, it's actually the value of your asking whether you're on the defense or the, the government side for access to people who are actually in the housing facility that the client is in so that you don't get surprised and so that you don't get the gigante Trump. Um, the other thing that, uh, the other thing to collect, and it's a, it is, in my view, 
um, the still the most comprehensive ruling on competence assessments there is it, by one of the very fine judges. You wouldn't think of, Louisiana is a mecca for many things. And, uh, but you wouldn't think it's for, for a judicial review of forensic mental health practice. But in fact, uh, Judge Berrigan, uh, Helen Berrigan, who is down in that area, and, and several other judges have, actually, have written some of the, the now best considered um, rulings, recent rulings in forensic mental health. And Duhon was uh, one of the earlier rulings in the area of competence assessment. The takeaway from it was an unusual takeaway because it was a situation in which, oddly enough, one of the same experts from the, Berger, uh, from, uh, the Merriweather case, Dr. Berger from BOP, was one of the examiners. And uh, the, the BOP, I think, very confidently submitted their reports about this young man's competence he was intellectually disabled, but the notion was he'd gone through a restoration group and there was no doubt he was restored and, you know, what's the problem here? And part of what the judge asked was, well, what are the elements, let's go through the elements of competence and tell me, link the methodology used and data collected to each one of the elements of competence. And they got to the drope element of ability to consult with his lawyer, the rational degree of understanding. And the notion was, I, I understand you gave the CAI. I understand you gave some of the elements from the MacArthur competency assessment tool. I understand you did your kind of gigante review, um, talking to nurses and some of the custodial staff. But where is it that you actually concentrated your evaluation on this particular element? And the judge concluded, and this is a conclusion that I think has been drawn by a number of people in your professions, that there's really nothing that you bring to the table with the exception maybe of the assessment of somebody's capacity to uh, assist a lawyer. Unless you've done some focused work, there's nothing that equips you to actually render useful and reliable opinion testimony about somebody's ability to assist counsel unless you've done something more than uh, an interview and give one of the, one of the assessment tools uh, and even some of the second generation tools. And that's what this judge concluded and she barred the testimony. And she actually went beyond that. When looking at the competency restoration issue, she said, and this is something that Richard Rogers has actually mentioned when he breaks down the, competent, when the concept of competence and, and he encourages the differentiation between, um, differentiate between what can be attributed to rote memorization and what really sheds light on somebody's functioning uh, that, that would be related to uh, competency. And this judge astutely said, you know, yeah, you got this person to memorize certain things, but that isn't really shedding light on the issues. And so the testimony was excluded. If you go into federal court and you haven't looked at Duhon, Duan's been mentioned now in 10 other rulings. And if you, have a, uh, if you have people on both sides who've actually done their homework, the lawyers, you're gonna run into um, to, to some issues if you haven't looked at some of this case law. And that's why, again, it may not be mentioned specifically in some of your practice guides, and maybe it shouldn't be, because it changes. And that's part of the reason why, for example, the California book on, on the California procedure and practice that Patty was talking about is actually uh, published every year because we put the yearly changes in the, in the relevant case law in it, but it's meant for judges and lawyers and uh, those sorts of reptiles, not for people like you. But, uh, but it actually mentions a lot of your literature. It mentions a lot of the, uh, a lot of the members of Division 41. And the point is this judge would expect that kind of practice. So they, if nothing else, if you're, 
especially for those of you beginning your career, etch, tattoo the name Gigante on you. So um, this slide, this uh, another in a string of illegible slides, it is lists for you uh, a number of cases that were, and, and incidentally, for the very few who may actually be interested in some of this, uh, some of these citations, I'm more than happy. Believe me, I have no social life at all, so I'm more than happy to hear from anyone. And uh, if you want these slides, I'm happy to make them available to you. Let me tell you why I, I picked these cases and what they mean and, you know, that kind of thing. These are cases in which federal judges actually made some decisions in Atkins cases, in intellectual disabilities, somebody um, eligible or not for the death penalty. But again, part of the takeaway for us, right, us being we're interested in this field, we're interested in the improvement of our practice in the field, and we want to know what it is we're missing if we're really, if we've, if we've gotten basic equipment, especially from um, forensic mental health literature that's aimed at forensic mental health professionals, what is it we're missing? What you would be missing is probably as uh, granular a discussion of the assessment of intellectual disability and the status of intellectual disability in legal terms that you will get. At least at this point, there isn't anybody in the field of forensic mental health <coughs> who comes, they may come close, but they, they don't come as close as they should to replicating some of the analysis that you see in these decisions. And again, remember that when you go into a courtroom, people no longer care what you got your doctorate in or what your literature, uh, what your production of literature is if you aren't familiar with the contours of the forensic mental health issues that that judge happens to care about. Because that's what that judge is going to be interested in. And these judges started out with issues of qualifications. Is ba a background in clinical practice with a lack of familiarity with the, uh, with the classification system of the American Association on Intellectual and Developmental Disability, is that enough? Can any clinician show up and talk about intellectual disability? Um, what about the test choices? What, what is the difference between the Stanford Binet 4 and 5? Does it matter that we're not getting the same measurement of processing speed when we're comparing waste instruments and Stanford Binets? I mean, I certainly don't know any of this stuff. No. But these are the sorts of questions that are addressed. Two, three days on norm choices. People emailing like maniacs to Robert Heaton about what he really meant about uh, this or that. What, what, uh, what, whether people um, are actually correctly uh, characterizing the Flynn effect. And incidentally, there are judges who've now invented their own intervals or their own uh, figures to apply to the Flynn effect. And so when you are in front of those judges, it actually makes some sense to have read some of their stuff so that you know where their particular insanity is. And you can either correct it or work with it, work with their, their delusional system. But the point is, these are 30, 40, 50, 60 page rulings in which there is a lot of careful examination of who the professionals who testified are, who made the more credible presentation, where they fell down, where some of the, uh, the methodologies uh, left black holes, et cetera. Part of what, uh, and, and I think again, part of the takeaway here really comes from the recent U.S. Supreme Court decision in Hall versus Florida, which is where the, the court finds essentially that Florida's statute 
that, um, that passes, that essentially defines a 70 IQ uh, as the bright red line that will separate those who are intellectually disabled from those who are not for death penalty purposes. Part of what the court says in that um, ruling is Florida's statute is out of line with established medical practice. How do you see what established medical practice is? Well, you look to the literature that you have actually published and, and uh, to standards that you promulgate and that your field has developed and you look to the case law. And that's why, um, the, that's why one has to underscore this notion that a forensic mental health expert does indeed have to be familiar, and more, it has to be more than a passing familiarity for a given case with uh, the forensic mental health rulings. So let's just, again, let's, let's work with this concept and use an example, um, and if you read from, from the various works on competence assessment, you know, the question is, the question I'm, I'm kind of putting out there as the straw man or the straw woman for this part of the discussion is, does it make sense to talk to the defense lawyer? Should that be part of your standardized practice? And you looked at Melton et al, and they make a strong recommendation and they have their reasoning. And you go back to Grisso's seminal work on the assessment of competence and well, yeah, you should do it because it informs you about specific behaviors. And then you look to the best practices and an important resource, arrest reports, et cetera. Not one of these sources actually references the, the case law. And, and maybe, maybe they're right. Drope versus Missouri, one of the things that the U.S. Supreme Court and this, this predates all three of those sources, says that, uh, among other things, the, the notion here is you don't have to take a lawyer's say-so, but a lawyer's um, view that somebody is not competent is unquestionably a factor that should be considered. Well, maybe what they're talking about there is really that's something that the court should consider. It's not really a data point that anyone else needs to worry about. Although in DROPE, what happened in DROPE was basically a case works its way through the Missouri system. It gets up into the federal system, and in the federal system, the litigators say, look, if three times DROPE's lawyer brings up problems he's having talking to DROPE, they bring forward Drope's spouse who talks about uh, the way Drope had gone sideways uh, during the pendency of the case and, and uh, talks about his behavior and um, what happened here was a travesty. It should be done again. And so the U.S. Supreme Court said, well, it should. And it's not like they were depending on a forensic mental health professional for the data points that caused that case to be reversed. But let's say again, let's mar that may not be clear enough evidence that we should rewrite the books. What about this? What do you say about that? That to me, coming from the US Supreme Court, would tend to mean that I might want to actually talk to the defense lawyer. And what it means to me if I'm a graduate student and I'm aiming towards a career in forensic psychology, or I'm an experienced assessor, that I now know that the US Supreme Court actually tells me about one data source. Now, I, I may find, and I've had very experienced people, and so, in fact, someone who writes one of the seminal works on forensic mental health assessment, of an influential work, tell me, well, my concern in dealing with uh, defense lawyers is that, you know, you're a biased source of information. That's a valid point. On the other hand, it, it's valid, but is it valid with a capital V? 
how do you balance it against the fact that you have a uh, you have a United States Supreme Court that actually talks to you about the utility of that information that relies in Medina part of what the court was doing was saying look there, there has been some raising of a question of whether Medina was actually incompetent, but his lawyer said that he felt that Medina was competent. I don't know where that lawyer is, hopefully not still practicing, but, uh, but in any event, I mean, that actually addresses the bias question in, a, in an interesting way. But that's the data point that was relied on by the U.S. Supreme Court. In Godinez versus Moran, and this is part of the reason I was telling you, uh, Godinez tends to be cited, in my view, for fairly bizarre propositions in the forensic mental health literature. But, but I'm glad that it is actually cited because it's an informative U.S. Supreme Court decision on competence assessments. But one of the things to me it says, again, to borrow from Dick Rogers with this notion of operationalizing practices is, for you to be able, assuming that, that these areas are actually serious areas of inquiry, because they're out outlined by the U.S. Supreme Court, for you to understand whether somebody should decline to cross-examine witnesses, well, maybe that deals with a general principle. But whether somebody should put on a defense or raise one or more defenses does actually frame the question of whether that means that in a given case, you actually, instead of you know, the barroom brawl of the MacArthur competency assessment tool, whether you actually need to make inquiry about what the defenses are in a given case, what the elements of the crime are, and, and what this particular defendant needs to be able to negotiate, or at least some of the parameters for his or her decision making in a given case. Now, there's some examiners who are great believers in case-specific examination, others aren't. But the point is, you have case law that tends to, to point you in that direction. And uh, in my view, it should be part of the portfolio. Look at this, another, this is a more recent Supreme Court decision that's referenced in none of the, of the uh, mental health literature that I was able to do a survey of. Uh, for example, an incompetent defendant would be unable to assist counsel in identifying witnesses and deciding on a strategy. I mean, how many times do forensic examiners, especially those who are court appointed, get into those sorts of issues and, and in terms of um, focusing on, okay, what's the nature of this case? Uh, what are the defenses available? What are the pleas you can enter? And, and I understand there are some competency assessment tools, some structured interviews that allow you to get there, but it's not like that is a permissive practice. It's something that's actually framed by the court that defines what the floor of competence is, that is explaining to you its view of drope and dusky in action. And this gets us back to this pronouncement from Duhon. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, I'll tell you that some of this quote was actually attributed to one of the, uh, I was gonna oversell this person, but the quote within a quote actually comes from me. And, and, and Michael Burt, who's a much better lawyer, a smarter guy, and, uh, but we, we co-wrote something on on uh, competence and the judge uh, was unwise enough to, to propagate it. And that, but the point is, I do think that the essential point, and I'm sure the judge was not, it's not like she was bowled over by, by uh, the article she was reading. She simply conveniently borrowed from a pleading that had been filed by a defense lawyer. On, on what a, a defensible competency assessment tool is. So again, this is an area in which gathering up the case law, understanding its parameters is very important. Uh, another area that one occasionally gets into is to tape or not to tape, and also what I think are some major misunderstandings 
uh, and, and again, for, for those of us who um, uh, are from Canada or from other countries, part of the procedural rules or the procedural rules are in fact different. So, um, uh, you know, some of this babbling I'm doing is really irrelevant to some of the concerns that you would have. But to tape or not to tape, and also uh, raising something that's mentioned in the competency pamphlet, which I found very interesting and which I, I wanted to... When the evaluation is court-ordered, the defendant does not have the right to remain silent. That's what's written here. And so, since I know my best practices when I see them, I'm, I'm going to accept that. But I'm actually going to do... Um, I'm going to do what the practice suggestion is. I'm going to actually look at the case law. And I want to know a little bit more about whether, I mean, there, there are some ethical concerns I have if I'm a forensic mental health examiner about having a third party observer about this tape situation, about the legitimacy of my, of, uh, you know, published tests being videoed. God knows what these defense reptiles are going to do. Um, with it and the coaching that may go on. And, and these are legitimate concerns. I don't want to... Um, and so we know that there are... I mean, there are guidelines you have and, uh, for psychologists. There are guidelines that are uh, written out for, uh, for uh, every aspect of the profession. But the point is uh, there's a, a misunderstanding of some of the reasoning behind creating a tape-recorded um, chronicle of an assessment session. And we're going to keep that pronouncement from the competency pamphlet in mind. I mean, what are you doing? Are you just creating a record? Well, to a certain degree, you are, because it, it is convenient from a lawyering standpoint to actually know what an examiner has asked the client. But it goes beyond that. One of the longest, one of the most verbose, uh, and in some, and I think it would be fair to say he's now retired, so I, it's not like I'm being completely obsequious here. Uh, but uh, one of the smarter judges around in dealing with some of the issues that, that uh, are at, at that seam I was talking about was Mark Bennett. And let me, let me explain to you what's here. Here's the principle we're addressing. Many forensic mental health evaluations occur after an individual is charged with a crime. When that person is charged with a crime and appears in court in the US system, as soon as that person is arraigned, that person now has the right to remain silent. That person also has the right, if it's a felony, to a lawyer. There are Fifth and Sixth Amendment issues that are presented by any kind of a court-ordered evaluation. Estelle versus Smith, that first citation, is a case in which the state of Texas is trying to kill Smith. And the infamous Dr. Grigson, who is otherwise known as Dr. Death, graduate of a school of animal husbandry and medicine, is actually not a psychiatrist, but he used to go in, he, 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 was a, he, he was a utility ball player for the state of Texas, and he would go in and, and he would do evaluations. And he is asked by the trial judge to evaluate Smith for competence. And he, go, and he leaves uh, the competence evaluation and says, Smith is competent. And the next thing you know, Dr. Grigson is called at Smith's penalty trial and says, not only did I evaluate him for competence, but I can tell you he has no mental disorders that are mitigating, and the bastard is dangerous, because I did a dangerousness assessment. And the defense lawyer goes, nobody told me you were even doing a competence evaluation. How is it that I end up um, being Sunday punched this way, and the U.S. Supreme Court says, well, there's a problem here. 
because um, when you define a particular endeavor that's going to result in an invasion of somebody's right to remain silent, you at least have to establish what the scope of that invasion is going to be. This was a competence evaluation that turned into a dangerousness evaluation. This guy had the right, he had the right, the Sixth Amendment right is the right to a lawyer. He had the right to notice so that he and his lawyer could consult, and he had the right to remain silent at least on issues that went beyond the scope of the examination. And this is actually a, um, this I, I would respectfully say to the fine authors of the pamphlet is, uh, it is actually the law. The law is that you do have the right to remain silent. Now, you can waive that right, it's true, but where there's a court-ordered evaluation you have the right, whether it's an insanity evaluation, or a, an evaluation of mitigation, an evaluation of any condition, you have the right to remain silent. Now, you're, the question is, what if the examiner asks you and you say, Doc, I'm not going to answer that question. Can that answer be used against you? Well, that's finely sliced as well, and we'll take a look at it. But the point is, this is not you don't need to guess at this. There are rules about this, and there's very little literature in the domain of forensic mental health assessment that actually addresses this. And so you get people doing assessments, even fairly high-end forensic mental health professionals who are told, look, I don't want you going into the following area, and they come back very smartly and go, well, you know, I think I need to in order for me to to do a defensible assessment. And sometimes there's a highly rational legal reason for um, the discussion. So this summarizes what I was saying earlier about the various rights that are framed by the case law. And that's why in the Unabomber case, for example, uh, when they were doing the competence evaluation, what the defense lawyers did is they got the judge to order, this was when the government was doing it, to order a contemporaneous video feed. The, the government lawyers didn't have the feed. The session is taped, and the lawyers get a chance, to, the defense lawyers get a chance to object to anything that's outside the scope of a competence evaluation. In the Sampson case, which is now about to be retried in Boston, um, the, the same thing. The notion is the importance of tape recording is that it helps preserve the accused's Fifth Amendment right. And if you're dealing with a lawyer who doesn't, who has not talked to you about taping in the course of a forensic assessment, you're talking to a lawyer who's got a problem. And you, again, if you're practicing in U.S. courts, you need to prompt that discussion. And if the lawyer is actually practicing according to best practices, that lawyer will talk to you about the advisability of taping the session. In California, uh, we finally got a scope and notice statute passed so that if there's going to be a court order to evaluation of the accused, we actually get a right to see the list of tests you are going to use, which I've, you know, some, I've heard some forensic mental health experts explain that that may be the cause for them to jump out a window if it's on the first floor or under. But, um, but uh, you, you know, that, but this is going to encourage coaching. It's going to encourage all sorts of horrible things. But the point is the court makes a threshold, among other things, now in advance, we get a chance to litigate whether some of the stuff goes outside the scope. Do you really have to give a PCLR in a competence evaluation? And I've had to litigate that issue. And you know, you get down to some interesting brass tacks. Um, you also, uh, the, um, the California statute defines a clinical examination as, uh, or the, the clinical interview as a test. So you get a chance to cabin that as well. Um, and uh, 
which actually gets into a, a question that does come up, and it's a rare question, but it does come up in certain kinds of cases. What if the defense lawyer goes to you or actually goes to the judge and says, I don't want the examiner asking my client about the facts of the case, in a de in, uh, the facts of the crime, rather, in a death penalty case, in an insanity case? Are you insane? Haven't you been to the Division 41 meetings? Where have you been? We have to get the widest database available, which makes amply good sense. Only there's a difficulty here. The law is standing in your way. Now, the court raised a question here. It didn't determine it, and as we'll see, in fact, what happens and what has happened is um, there's been a layering of decisions uh, about whether even if you say it's best psychological or forensic psychological practice for you to ask, let's say, about the, the facts of the crime, th there are varying ways that courts have looked at it. I, I, uh, part of what I highlighted here was the phrase taint attorneys, and if you can't read this, don't worry, I can't either, so I have no idea what, what it says. But, but I do remember part of this slide, and it really, uh, it deals with part of what I think the authors of the competence pamphlet were trying to get at, which is not so much in competence evaluations, Competence evaluations, you don't waive your Fifth Amendment right. It's just that in some jurisdictions, California being one of them, you have what's called judicial immunity. You, the, the state cannot use the statements that you've made if you're the accused against you to prove your guilt. Uh, the, the, the stuff you've come up with during the competence evaluation. But that isn't universally true. Not all states agree with that. But why is it that this, this uh, artistic slide is there? You know what a taint attorney is? A taint attorney is actually a lawyer um, who usually works for the state who is, who is put on a case, especially when the defense wants to litigate the admissibility of statements that have been made during a mental health examination. And the defense is saying, I don't want the actual prosecutors on the case knowing what my client said until you've ruled whether or not everything he said was, was, uh, is admissible or whether there's some stuff you're going to exclude. That's what taint team lawyers are. And uh, we've spent a lot of time litigating issues about taint team lawyers. And again, in your literature, I don't see any of that uh, mentioned. But in terrorism cases, in uh, some cases that, um, that now involve a lot of uh, cases that involve mental health defenses of various kinds, you're seeing access to taint team lawyers. And what does it mean to you? Again, it doesn't really mean a lot for you other than there is, in fact, a set of constitutional privileges that apply to whatever the defendant is saying during a, an examination, and it's something you need to be attentive to. You need to find out what the law and the jurisdiction is. In Oklahoma, there was a question about whether uh, the accused could be asked or the examiner could be asked about the accused's refusal to answer questions um, during the course of an insanity examination. Uh, in Oregon, Oregon, and again, these slides for the, for the very few for whom this is going to be bedtime reading, I, I will make these slides available because I know they're, they're hard to read. But th this simply illustrates that in Oregon, Oregon has a very restrictive rule in terms of the state's ability to use either the refusal to answer questions or a ruling by a judge uh, excising certain areas from a forensic examination. New Jersey sides with the mental health examiners whose viewpoint is, look, we have to define the assessment according to our uh, standards of practice. And so we do need, in fact, to get certain data 
And so we need to have some dialogue, some level of dialogue about the framework of the, uh, of the assessment. California, up till recently, this is not absolutely the latest thing, had a situa had what's essentially the federal rule, which is the accused waves, this is in a mental state defense, waves or, or uh, where he or she raises a disqualifying condition like mental retardation in a death penalty case, intellectual dis uh, uh, disability, you waive the privilege um, as far as it takes for an examination to take place so that your condition can be rebutted by the other side. And there are situations you're going to encounter with sophisticated litigators in which you're going to get in the examination room and the client is going to have a three by five card and is going to start reading from it that she or he uh, respectfully is declining to answer questions and is referring you to the lawyer who's standing in the hall and you're gonna to have to have these discussions. But the point is, this is a nuanced area, you should be aware of it, and this is an area in which uh, most of us, lawyers, judges, mental health examiners, are often wading into the unknown. But unless you've actually acquired the case law, you're not gonna know you're in this area. Um, and uh, this is more stuff from Mark Bennett, who's the judge I was talking to you about, who made a determination in this case, in the Angela Johnson case, again, well-known for, for federal litigators, a well-known um, death penalty case that was just resolved earlier this year. But he made the decision that in that case, the examiners would not be allowed to ask her crime-specific facts going into the penalty phase, but that if she opened the door, he would revisit his ruling, which kind of makes sense. Uh, so uh, yet another statement from, this is from the case that uh, Michael Burt, who did the Angela Johnson case, and I now uh, are in the Fell case. That was the, the ruling in Fell, was very similar to what I told you about, which is, uh, this is where somebody puts his mental uh, condition at issue. He's waived his privilege, at least to, to, the, to the extent that's necessary to rebut it. But this is, as you can see, from all of these disparate slides and disparate rulings, these rulings are all over the place, and you need to inform yourself of the fabric of the pertinent law. And I do think there's a practice guideline that should come out of it, which is um, it, it goes beyond what tends to be in best practices literature, which is that you should kind of acquaint yourself with the law. It's not that you should. It's really, it should be that you must acquaint yourself with the law, that you must do due diligence to understand the legal contours of uh, the assessment that you're doing and the procedural rules related to it. Because if you rely on, on either some, some of the bilge that people like me have written for lawyers or some of the more informed writing that people have written for you in the, mental, in the forensic mental health fields, you're going to be led astray. And that's why you need to revisit part of your due diligence is to revisit these issues when you uh, get into them. So the, other thing, just to know generally, and here this is shooting fish in a barrel because it has to do with the issue of dangerousness assessment, but the bottom case is uh, the case that Patty was talking about earlier was the first uh, death penalty case in statehood in Hawaii, um, but the top case is from the Northern District of Indiana where judges basically looked through the PCLR reasoning that, that um, assessment experts had for giving a dangerousness assessment and in context said they felt that the PCLR was too unreliable to give, particularly given the Eighth Amendment's command of reliability. And so another thing that you should do is make sure, uh, that this goes back to what I was talking to you about earlier in this show when we were talking about competence assessments and the ruling in Duhon where a judge says, wait a minute, you're missing an entire component of a competence assessment. 
your methodology, your methods have not covered this essential legal requirement. And I'm not going to let you testify. Here it's a little bit different. You've given a certain instrument or you're saying you need to give it. And I, I uh, as the judge, have looked at, my, at the requirement placed on me to admit only reliable evidence. And I have concerns that this is unreliable, maybe reliable for you, but it's unreliable for me, the judge. Um, and the same was true aided in part, though I don't know that he knows this, by, by, um, uh, by Richard Rogers' very useful short article on uh, multi-scale inv personality inventories. The judge in this case uh, had some real questions about the potential misuse of a personality inventory where mental condition was the was the issue. So the last thing I wanted to cover with you, and I, and I do appreciate your, your patience um, with, all of this, uh, with all of this legal jive, um, is, uh, has to do with the intersection between your work product and criminal case discovery. And I, one of the most valuable sources of information that I've seen, um, and again, I'm sure there are wiser minds uh, that have seen better stuff, but for me, since I am just uh, one step above crayons and paper, um, the, uh, this initial mental, the Forensic Mental Health Best Practices pamphlet, Foundations of Forensic Mental Health Assessment, talks about uh, it g provides a summary of what were then the rules concerning the maintenance of documentation of an assessment, your ethical rules, some of the advisory rules, et cetera. One of the things that the literature that you have, that you have access to does not really address um, is the uh, it, it, it are the rules of discovery in given court systems that apply to experts and the foundation for their testimony. And so, you know, this, it, I guess the rule of thumb that's put together is that anything you put in your file folder on a particular client or a particular case might be considered fair game. But now it goes beyond that. What about the phone, your phone records or the records of your conversations with outside sources? Let's say you were one of the people who called Robert Heaton on the norm issue. Is that fair game? How about your emails? Is that fair game? The answer is it may be, because it may be that part of your actual foundation um, does have to do, among other things, with information you've collected as part of your acquisition of information. And um, I, the reason I point to this is there have been some very specific rulings in given cases out of a variety of jurisdictions that I think have been highly surprising to people in the mental health field when all of a sudden they were victimized with a, okay, we are actually going to ask for your good faith here, but we're, we want a data dump of all of your communications with the following outside experts that we understand you consulted with as part of your acquisition of foundation. So one of the things that you should collect that should be on your desktop as you approach a given case is whether there are any idiosyncratic discovery practices that are used in that particular court that you may have to object to early in the game or that you may want to talk to the lawyers who are involved in the case uh, about. And again, um, some, some of the literature that I see, and I, get, and I think here I'm talking more to some of the, the up and coming uh, members of the field, uh, some of the literature really under-informs you about what it means to keep documentation and what documentation you're going to be expected to produce 
um, when, a, when you actually testify, depending on the court that you're in. So I, I again want to emphasize to you what a privilege it is to be able to address this group, what, what really valuable work um, you're doing, and for those of you who are coming into the field, you're going to do. And if there's any, any respectful takeaway from this session, it's, again, part of what gets put in a picnic basket when you approach actual casework is the legal fabric, the legal contours, the legal architecture of the examination process and everything related to it in the given case so that you know you've done your due diligence and that you're going to be doing reliable work. I really appreciate your attention. Have a good day. Take care. <laughs>